Nakedly Examined Music needs your support. Please go to patreon.com slash nakedly examined music and sign up for a small recurring contribution to keep the music flowing. And using Patreon's feed of this podcast will ensure you never have to hear any commercials ever. Thanks! You are listening to Nakedly Examined Music, a podcast about songs and songwriters. My name is Mark Lintonmeyer. For more information about this podcast, please check out nakedlyexaminedmusic.com. My guest for episode 99 is Elizabeth LeFay. She's based on the West Coast and she performs under the name Globe Lamp. You're right now listening to Hex, a track from her old band Meowtane from 2012. She had by that time already released the Globe Lamp EP and became well known as a touring vocalist with Foxygen. She's now released three albums as Globe Lamp, plus a collection of covers and a number of singles since 2014. We'll be discussing Everything's a Spiral from her most recent 2018's Romantic Cancer, then looking back to Controversial slash Confrontational from The Orange Glow 2015, then to Warrior from her first album Stardust 2014, and we'll conclude by listening to another track from Romantic Cancer, Black Tar. For more information, check out facebook.com slash globelamp. So I will have just played a little of Hex from the Meowtown EP 2012. We're going to get pretty quickly to Everything's a Spiral from the new one, Romantic Cancer 2018. Do you want to give us a, a brief thumbnail sketch of the evolution from that long ago point to the new one before we actually hear it? Everything's a Spiral is actually like one of the first songs I ever wrote, which is weird because it's like on, you know, this is a newer album. But I recorded it like six or seven years ago, but... It never really got a proper release. It was on like the Globe Lamp EP, which was isn't on Spotify or iTunes, you know. So my singing got better too over the years since I wrote it. So I felt like it just needed to get re-recorded and put on an actual release because everybody who's seen me live knows that song. It's like a song that if you've watched Globe Lamp live before I was like having albums out, I'd always play that song. So it kind of felt good to revisit that territory. So it always feels good when something you wrote that's old, you still like. Do you want to say what it's about? It's up for interpretation, but you know, I wrote it. It could be about anything because it's like, maybe it's too early. Maybe it's too soon. It's about timing. Like for me, it was about someone in my life, I guess, that I fell in love with or, and you know, it wasn't the right time in our life. And I was like, maybe if the stars had aligned differently, maybe if I would have met you at a different time, you might get along with someone, but something could be going on in your life that makes it so you never got to be with them.
in August with soy in the falling leaves of autumn and broke through the frost of the winter to be born again in the spring. You've really got an interesting sense of dynamics in this whole thing. I mean, it's a very simple song. You know, it's pretty much the same three chords, well, and then a seventh at the end. One of the first things I wrote, so definitely it's just like a three chord progression. But also at the same time, I think that's sometimes the best stuff that for me growing up, I was always around a lot of guys who were really good at music and played mouth rock. And we're like, no, 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 because shred and stuff. And I was always like shy to show them my music because they would always act like stuff like cat power, or, like something with a few chords was like not real, not good or something. So I never showed anybody till I was older my music. And like people always would make fun of me or whatever about using like one or two chords. It's like, or something like Woody Guthrie did. And so did a lot of folk singers. Like I'm not trying to be Jimi Hendrix or math rock musician here. And that's like one of the earliest songs I wrote. Some of my songs have way more because I had a complex about that. People giving me crap about it, you know, being like, oh, you only have two chords. Then like on other albums, like the Orange Glow, there's like songs where there's not, you know, there's a lot more chords going on. I tried to write, yeah, some dissonant stuff. But then now I went back and Romantic Cancer is like the most stripped down album I have because all my other albums are way more psychedelic. Like they have like a lot of overdubs. Like I would overdub my vocals all the time and put effects and tape loops and just you know i just wanted an album though that was like when i perform it's me alone okay so i wanted people to have an album in the discography that's very stripped down because i don't want all my albums to just be like really trippy and psyched out mazzy star dreamy i like that but it's like you know i like listening to bob dylan and like dolly parton and johnny cash too and stuff and they don't have like a bunch of stuff covering up their vocals it's just like the guitar and the singing you know i'm a fan of like the old-fashioned i guess type of songwriting I wouldn't have noticed, it might be more obvious watching you play it, but just listening to it, like until I kind of sat down, I didn't even realize that it was that few chords because you throw in so many articulations of the different sections that, you know, it speeds up a little, it slows down a little. Now we're we're going to have just this strange pause right before a word. And <laughs> when I was at school, I was in a college, we took this music class. And after that, we learned all this experimental music stuff. I tried to write a song with one note because I was like, we're learning about noise musicians and how they would do really weird stuff. You know, like it could be three chords, but if you can make up a melody over those three chords that don't sound like the three chords, like everything's a spiral has different singing parts in it, even though it's three chords, like how you were saying, like the variations, it's the same thing the whole time through, but the singing changes and the timing. I'm really into weird timing, I guess. That's why I don't have a band because I don't have the patience to teach people. Because when I'm live, it's kind of just theatrical because I can get really loud and really quiet. And like my songs, I guess I develop those weird rhythm cadence things too to keep people I think when you're performing alone it's hard to keep people's interest sometimes and I think I became more of like a weird singer because it made people listen to me live more like compared to by just a girl singing a song pretty the whole time like it's very easy to do that as a girl the whole time sometimes live I, I'm a little bit more like kooky because I like to sing high and low like you know when people know like their natural range 
Well, that's because they've been in choir or something and they're reading music and they have to like, oh, no, I see that there's a D there. I can't actually sing that I. I need to do something else. But if you're, yeah, if you're not looking at paper, there's no reason to know that. Some singers, like, they have one distinct voice. You know, it's like Kate Bush sings really high. Nico sings really low. Jim Morris sings, sings low. Like, for me, it's like I like to sing both. It's hard for me to decide sometimes when I write a song how to sing it. I'll write a song and it's like, what voice am I using? It's weird. It's like I have, like, characters. There's like this old woman voice, this like weird British dude. It's very weird, but it's like in my head. I guess I was always into musicals growing up. I think honestly that might have something to do with it. Yeah, so I was wondering about some of the pronunciations that, you know, sometimes you get a little British, that sometimes this is more character thing than I wasn't really sure about that. I know, I'm not trying to do that, okay? Like, I know I have the British thing, and it's like <laughs> that was not on purpose. And I do, because I listen to a lot of British music, you know? So I was in London and the dude was asking me that on the interview. He's like, you sound like you're from here, you know? And I was like, oh, like, oh, he's like, it's some of your songs. And I'm like, because of the British listening, but also maybe because of the musicals. Like, I was obsessed with sound of music. Like, I know all the songs and they're very, like, theatrical. Like, for example, Warrior. Somebody once told me this. I'll never forget this. It's a very weird comparison. But the fact that somebody made the comparison was like, maybe they were onto something. They were like, telling me on Warrior, there's this one part. It's like, Warrior Heart, we are all. Warriors with the leg of the bow and the foot. This part, and my, this guy told me he reminded them of the part in the sound of music, like high on the hill with the little meat goat head. <laughs> <laughs> sure, you don't know where those melodies get in your head. It's totally natural. So, like, I never ever thought of that, but I love that movie. So I was like, maybe subconsciously that did do something. But like, I think the musicals kind of did bring out the weird. Because when I was young, I wanted to be in musicals. I was a very shy person, so there was no way in hell I was ever going to be in one. But, like, that was my, I would love to, like, have been in a play or, like, perform. Because to me, I guess performance and songwriting are a little different, too, you know? The theatrical aspect sometimes comes out more when I perform. I feel like when you perform sometimes, or when you're playing a song, sometimes you can get in a trance. For me, sometimes I don't think completely, I just play. That's like the British voice comes out. That was never like a purpose thing. Like I never was thinking like, I'm going to try to sound British. It's actually embarrassing. Like I don't want to, <laughs> people thinking I'm trying to be British. Okay. It just like came out. I noticed Tori Amos is somebody who will tweak vowels for expressive effect. I mean, you can make something louder, you can make something softer, but actually tying it in that, like just to twist the vowel to something else. She's a huge influence. She's one of my favorite musicians. When you were actually, it's funny because when I just said the channeling thing, when you're performing music, I read this book by Tori Amos and she like wrote it with somebody about performing. I love her. And in it, she talks about that, how she like channels different energies when she performs, like of certain goddesses. And also I've seen her before live and she definitely influenced me a lot. Like, and you know, not a lot of people my age really listen to her that much. She's kind of quirky too. And she also, no one's ever really pointed that out about her to me. Yeah. The way she does do words, she really strings out shit or uses it her own ways and i think that's yeah that's creative we only have a limited toolbox here with music so with everything in the spiral that with that being in your live set for so long are the places where it rises and falls maybe a little different every time or did that evolve I, like i noticed about a minute and a half in the i said it and i did it anyways like that actually seems the most energetic part and that's really just a way of introducing the first chorus like it's not the thing you've saved for the the end of the song But is that the kind of thing that is not, well, if you did it tomorrow, it maybe it wouldn't be. <laughs> maybe the climax would be later or something. That is always more intense. See, this song, because I've played for so long, I know where the parts are now. So that's why I wanted to re-record it. Because the EP, it's not, the original version doesn't have those breaks. The original version is just me playing it this whole way through pretty the whole time without any changes, really. The first time I recorded it. It's not like it's bad. It's just like over the years, I developed a different style of playing it live. Like that part of where I said it, I did it anyway. It's just to be more broady and like punk heart. And so it was never really conveyed on the like recording originally. Sometimes that's what scares me about recording a song. If I haven't played it a lot live, it might change. Like if I wrote a song and record it and then like four years later, I'm play, playing it for four years and I finally go to record. It's just like weird. I might get better at playing it. One would hope so. <laughs> I know, but it's weird as an artist to listen to something you recorded and think it sucks, but at the time you didn't think it sucked. I find sometimes I go back to demos and I like the way that I wrote a melody originally. Like that was the original idea, but then it's morphed over time as I've screwed around with it or played it live. And that actually going back in like, oh, I actually kind of like that melody that I wrote in the first place. Maybe I should at least change a little bit to do that. Because, yeah, it just 
I don't know if you find this that if you just play a song too much, it just it gets boring to play it. It has to go through some metamorphosis over time. Of course, Bob Dylan is the extreme of that, that if you hear him live now, like it can get 40 seconds into a song before you know what it was. Like that, it has changed so radically. If I was like a huge rock star, I would never complain about having to play the same song, even though it's annoying. Okay, like I'd rather make money playing like a hit. I know it's annoying over and over again, but it's like when you look at the big picture, that's not the worst problem we could have as a band. You know, there's a lot of bands who act like, oh, like, they get so mad they have to play like their single or something a bunch. It's like, that's not that bad of a job. That's the only reason why anyone has heard of you. That's the only reason why you get to do this other creative stuff. <laughs> it's going to be okay. Yeah, it's like, I mean, I know that it's not fun. And it's, it's like sometimes, but it's like, you know, when I go see a band, you want to see the song you heard, you know. So say a little about just in the energy of this one, you have plenty of lyrics here. You've gone through a few, this la-da-da-da-da part that you put at the end. How would that come into the mix that it's the energy of the time? Like, I don't think I'm done yet. I'm out of lyrics, but let's just keep it going. Or would that be the, you're picturing a instrumental solo the first time, but you just sing it enough times and like, ah, let's just leave it. La da 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 da. I like the trailing off. I kind of like a little singing like melodies but that wasn't there originally. No, I like that probably was, I think, trumpet or something. I used to date a trumpet player, and we used to play that song together. And I think that, and a warrior too, he made up a trumpet part, and we got in a fight, so I never put it on there. So I sang it instead, which was like, are you a warrior? In the background, it's like, that was a trumpet line. <laughs> okay, so it's like, instead I just sing it, So because I remembered it. That might have been for everything to spiral too but then I just ended up liking it sometimes it's like more organic playing it live and there's like a part in there like that for me when I get to sing I'll be like it just I think it modified from playing it live it wasn't really in it when I wrote it it just sort of happened I think from playing it live it needed an ending like I said it was an old song so it's kind of like I was testing out writing a song there's a light keyboard part in the whole thing was that a kind of I've got it the main thing recorded now I'm gonna do a couple measures at a time or was it a single pass or how are you doing that yeah, like a single take. Oh, okay. Just listen to it with the headphones on and then just recorded the keyboard over it. Right, I think I noticed on this one, yeah, so around 426, like there's even either just a wrong chord or just like you extended it out a little extra <laughs> Yeah, so some weird placements in some of it. If people say you sound like you're doing 60s stuff, it's because you're not using a lot of the modern technology that is at your disposal. Generally, if I were doing an overdub keyboard part, because I'm not, you know, a great keyboardist, I would just do a little screw up, go back, punch in at that point. Given that you don't even have to punch in at this point, you know, it's just do 10 takes and just take the notes you want or copy it over there or something. But it seems like you just are avoiding any of that kind of digital manipulation. Yeah, and I have like ADD. So to me, that seems like a nightmare. Like I'm more (laughs) of a songwriter. Like I'm not a music producer. Like I respect that stuff, but it's like, I'm more about getting the soul out in the song. I feel like if somebody likes a song enough, you can always get it re-recorded. I feel like it's about people hearing the song and liking it. I just want people to hear my songs. Like a good song, sure, you can always record it good, but it's like how I'm re-recording everything's a spiral. I just feel like so many musicians I know are so intense about like everything being perfect. Oh my God, we got to overdub this, we got to do this. I'm more of like, yeah, sloppy. You're not sloppy, but I feel like I'd rather just put it out and keep making it more stuff and like, and then have more of my collection if I always wanted to re-record it, I can. Like, so many people will be spending forever on something that's kind of not even that fucking good. It's like, what? You just had to, like, make it a little bit better from what it wasn't even that good. Just put it out and make another album. That's my motto. Because I will overthink it. If not, then I'll be working on a song for three years. Like, I'm the type of person that's so OCD about my songs that I had to let go and not be OCD. That's why I'm like that. Or else I would be, like, super intense and want to overdub everything. And I, it stresses me out too much. So at a certain point, I just kind of let go with the, even my songwriting. There's certain songs that it's like I wrote as a joke. They end up being songs that people like the most. Like the songs I'll put a lot of effort into, like it's not the favorites. It'll always be like the songs that like I just wrote kind of like a ditty or something. And it's like, that'll be the song that they will be like, you saw it as a single. And I'm like, it made me realize like, wow, like, huh, the stuff I don't really even put that much effort into. People respond, but it kind of makes sense because if you look at like modern music, a lot of it sucks and people respond to it. The stuff without like a lot of, mental stimulus it's interesting as a songwriter to start realizing that too like your power and if you want to write a deep song or if you want to write a song you know that will just please people maybe you know it's weird as you start writing more songs realizing what affects people and if you're writing for you or them one just recording technique thing along those lines so i know there's a huge amount of fret noise on this which is something that 
it actually adds to the charm of this and the fact that you're doing it by yourself, there's room for it. Whereas that's the kind of thing that I kind of worry about, like, should I try to EQ it so there's less of it or even play that section again so I don't get, you know, as I'm going. The person helping me produce it wanted to add a lot of stuff. It was like, because it was me and this guy, Jay Anderson. But the thing is, I already told you I wanted it to be stripped down. But there's songs that people can envision a lot of stuff on. Yeah, I'm sure you can. There's a lot of parts you could add instruments on a lot of the songs. They would sound cool with instrumental parts, sure. This album was meant to be stripped down. So during the recording of it, I had to like talk the producing guy into that a lot because he kept wanting to add stuff or fix things. You know, like his natural inclination was to be like, let's do this, let's do this. And I had to be like, can you just believe in me? Like, I know it's weird, but like, I'm not a normal band. Like the way he recorded was very like systematic and I have my own way. And, you know, it ended up working out, but it was hard for him to kind of let go of the way he records people because he's like a perfectionist, the guy who records me. Okay. The guy who recorded me. And he was like, what? Some of the stuff I wanted to do, he's like, never had people do that. Everyone always wants everything to sound completely perfect. So, and with recording, people have always tried to control my songs in the studio a lot because it's like, it's just me with my guitar high or my piano. And then they're like, I can hear the drums. Oh my God. And right there, violin. And I hear a 247, you should add the bass. Then and it's like, I'm sure you do. And if I ask everybody else in the room, they're all going to have an opinion where something should go in the song too. Everyone has their own musical ear. But there's a reason why I didn't want that on this album. Like people were giving me crap about it. that There weren't a lot of overdubs. I was like, there could be one album that doesn't have a lot on there. I feel like our culture's obsessed with, like I'm into minimalism with music in a way. I think that our culture's obsessed with overdoing it with music. Like there's afraid of minimalism. Like you ever see what happened to like, like in the 90s, like Tracy Chapman was big at one point or Fiona Apple, like somebody who was like, or Tori Amos, somebody who's just by themselves with an instrument. Minimalism. I'm not only into that. But I feel like there is something magical in knowing that somebody doesn't need to hide behind a bunch of stuff, you know? Well, and the fact that it's cheaper (laughs) is a plus. (laughs) Like, I'm paying for you by the hour. Just don't fix it if I didn't ask you to. (laughs) I mean, the guy would have fixed it maybe for free. I was like, whatever. I don't know. It's weird. I know a lot of people would definitely want that fixed and want it out. Let's move on to the second one that's a little more produced here just to get this contrast out. The controversial confrontational from The Orange Glow 2015. You want to say a little about that before we play it? Yeah, that's definitely more of like a her new song that has drums. This is this is what everyone's looking for. It has drums, bass, guitar. It's got every band instrument you could want. I mean, I like this song. This was a song I wrote too as a joke. I wrote this because in Meowland, my old band, this, there was some drama between my old bandmate and his wife. And I was like writing that riff. The chorus, men cannot be trusted, and I know. And then I was joking, playing it, and my friend and Meow and like loved it. He was like, "That's my favorite thing you ever wrote." That's why I'm saying it was one of my joke songs. It ended up being the single. Like the label made me like push that song and Washington Moon, which is another song on that album that was a, a joke song. Not a joke song, but it's like a song I just wrote. I mean, just when I'm saying exactly what I think with the guitar, not like it wasn't really thought out. So that song has some weird time signatures too, I guess, at the end. And it goes all over the place, but I feel like it's kind of like my anthem, I guess. Like people always act like I'm really controversial or looking for a fight or I'm just an aggressive person. And it's like, I'm really not. I just, it says in the lyrics, I just say what I mean. Like, I feel like that causes people to get mad when you're honest. Like it makes people mad. I feel like that is the society we live in. If you are express your opinions, honestly, like people will just like think, oh, you're just controversial. It's like, no, that's just what I mean. So it's like literally what the song's about kind of to me. And then about it's definitely open for interpretation. Some of my lyrics are all over the place. Like I'll switch from different themes in a song. But that was that's like the main theme in it. And how men and can't be trusted. Men can't be trusted. Women too. But I believed you. So this isn't a gendered song towards men. It's about both of you. I'm not trying to be controversial or confrontational, it's just what I mean. People
let's zoom in on some of the lyrics there, even though you're saying this is, we didn't really talk in any detail on everything's a spiral either. So either of those is open season here. And I took a step into, in the unconscious with a step-by-step and early switch, and I was feeling the vibrations. You know, so <laughs> where does that come out? Again, may, you're saying this, you just tossed this out so fast. Maybe there is no plan from that, but I thought that was, a, that was an interesting move from the chorus that you were just quoting to that part. Yeah, and so that's what I was saying. Is sometimes some of the lyrics are like, so I was like, they might not be cohesive the whole time. I guess that's just like, yeah, well, I like the way it sounded wordplay, but took a step into like my uh, subconscious, like what's deeper than what appears, you know, and then I was feeling the vibes of myself or something. I don't know. And then it's like, but the part I fell from grace at an early age, I never said I knew the way you kept on following me anyway. That's just a warning to people or if anyone who's like, I never said I knew the way. Like, it's like, I might have opinions. These are my beliefs. That's like what that's about. It's like for you, I'm letting you know, I don't, I'm not saying I'm right. You know, that's just what I mean. So that's like a warning to someone like you kept on following me anyway. I never said I knew. Like, I'm not trying to be a leader here. And I even said I fell from grace at an early age. And then they say time heals the wounds, but I still feel the same. That's interesting because now it's been time has passed since I wrote that lyric. And, you know, I do feel a little better. (laughs) But that was like about my best friend dying. So I mix a lot of subjects into like one song sometimes. And the end is like, if I could trade all the wishes on a genie's lamp to have you back, I could trade anything on a genie's lamp to have you back. I want your old soul. I miss your old soul. That's what my friend who died. And she's like very heavily on the orange glow, meaning her presence. I wrote about her a lot. And she's actually the cover of my album, Stardust. The cover is a self-portrait of her. So she was like my biggest fan ever. Like my really good friend. She died of the flu. Very weird and random death. Okay, so it was... uh, What I find interesting in the story is that you said men cannot be trusted and women too was based on this joke, you know, that you were making about your bandmate and spouse but that you then internalized that. That was not a personal expression when you wrote it originally, but you then were able to write this very personal song around that, that somehow has that as its core. It's weird because it's mixing the two together, but it's also like, it's weird because when I wrote it at the time, my boyfriend heard it and he's like, is this about me? It wasn't, but we ended up breaking up and now I'm like thinking like, shit, maybe I should have taken that as a warning when he said, is it about me? Because he was not a good person. But the fact that he thought it was about him, you know, it's like saying, I don't believe you. I was like, no, why would it be about you? Well, and you're saying, I wish I could have you back. Like, if you're with somebody at the time, that's weird. <laughs> yeah, I want you back. That's about my friend. Yes, it's like, you know, I would trade anything to have you back. And it's like, I guess when that time period when she died, it was very hard for me. And people really called me controversial a lot, I guess, because I was like hard to deal with. So that probably ties into that. Like, you know, I was in a lot of pain. Well, I was wondering when I heard that about the old soul, that sounds like you're just calling your friend an old soul, you know, in the sense of somebody who's mature beyond her years, that kind of thing. But whereas I was reading it as a, a romantic song, it's more before you started acting like a dick, <laughs> you, I want the soul, I want the part of you before that came up. That's kind of what I was reading into it. <laughs> That's why it's like some of them are, are open for interpretation. There are some that are straight up more, uh-huh. but like that one to be like, no one would really know that ending unless I told them that. That's what it's about. You know, I wrote it in a way that so you can take it however you want. There's certain songs I don't write like that where it's straight up what it's about, but that song I wrote it so someone can interpret it how they want. Because I feel like that's how good songwriting is. Like, you want to be able to, like, connect to people even if they hadn't lost their best friend or something. Like, maybe they have had another experience where they relate to that line. So this sounds like it was floating around for some while before it got recorded as well? Yeah. It also has strange articulations again. I believed in you. Like, the way you say the I, like, that is exactly doing that Tori Amos Val thing that I was saying. Or I just was thinking like, oh, you're from California. That's just the the way you talk. I wasn't really sure. The way I talk and the way I sing is way different. It's like, what the hell? I was feeling the vibrations. That part's kind of fun, though, because it's like, from Grace. I don't know, because I like Kate Bush and Coco Rosie, too, and I feel kind of weird, too, with their pronunciations. Kate Bush definitely is, okay? And Kate Bush has, you were saying, yeah, she has her little high six-year-old voice, but she also, like, does this thing where she, and, you know, her babushka voice. Yeah. Babushka, babushka. <laughs> Whenever I show anyone, my friends, they're just like, what? And I show them the Kate Bush videos, but it's like, she wanted to test her husband. 
Like, she's just so weird with the voices. I just like that because I feel like a lot of women too are afraid to be like that more. It's like, it's easier to just be the pretty singer of a girl and like not take a chance to be kind of the weird, like Kate Bush is weird. Okay? Like, you know, like you watch videos of her. She's definitely an artist. She's like not trying to just appeal to the male gaze. She's a, a very weird artist. It's like a lot of girls, it's easy to just only rely on other things as a girl. So it's like a female performer. So that's why I think that like those performers are really cool too, because it's like, I mean, I'm not saying there's anything bad with relying on it as a woman, but it's kind of a sexist. And a lot of women do have to do more stuff, like have like more sex appeal than men and stuff to get things. So it's like always cool when somebody like Kate Bush, who's like totally weird or like Adele or somebody, you know, who's not your typical, she might not be like Kate Bush, but she's definitely not like the typical person you would like sell to the public, you know? You seem to be into a lot of older music. To me, Kate Bush only makes as much sense as she does to me because You know, I know David Bowie and Roxy music and that whole the 70s as the weird coming out of late 60s psychedelia into this weird prog rock and glam rock and all this stuff. And then what that then turned into with the post-punk. So I kind of grew up on Talking Heads and the Cars and the Police. And so, yeah, she makes a lot of sense in that context. But like, I don't think it's even just women. Like, you don't hear a lot of men on the radio that just sound weird. Sorry, I don't like a lot of new music, you know? You were saying how, like, oh, well, like you could tell it's inspired by older music, but it's really funny to me because a lot of music I like, people can't tell in my music, which makes me happy. For example, if I cover stuff, people always just want me to cover 60s music, which is cool. Like, I, that's what I like, mostly older music. But my favorite modern artist, like, I love Taylor Swift a lot. Like, I'm, like, a freaking, like, huge Taylor Swift fan. Nobody ever knows. Everyone's always shocked, and I always get in fights about it. It's insane. They're, like, if amount of battles have gotten in about it it's like people think that since i like her i know nothing about music i mean it's crazy the assumptions people will make to me like literally like online i'm like a songwriter that's like the only modern person i like and i'll have random people trying to tell me about like nirvana like this the other day this guy online was like telling me since i like taylor swift i have never heard of the smiths or nirvana or like listing all these bands to me it's just like insulting to me it makes me feel like you know people want to put you in a box so much like just because i'm a psych folk musician that doesn't mean i only have to listen to vashi bunyan and donovan kate bush like i like them all but it's like what's wrong with me liking something that doesn't sound like the music i make like i like that nobody could tell i listen to taylor swift you know why because that's cool because i'm not trying to be her but it's like when it comes down to it i actually listen to her all the time You can like music and not try to be them. My daughter is almost 16, and she was one of the people who just, I had to listen to all those Taylor Swift albums again and again in the car. And like, I really appreciated after a while, like how individual and sincere and creative she is. Like the fact that it's super popular. And, you know, if you just heard the couple songs on the radio or whatever. Yeah, the stuff on the radio is like the stuff on the radio, like. She's such a great songwriter. It's like not only that, but people don't realize like she was 15 when she freaking got signed. And you know what? A lot of those people who are pop stars were like Disney kids. She was like actually a musician who went to Tennessee and worked. There aren't a lot of people at the top. This is why I like her too, is a lot of girls. I think it's cooler. I like that you respect her too, because not only as a songwriter, there aren't a lot of people at the top anymore in the Billboard charts that even write music or play instruments. She's like the only girl at the top who like literally got there because I mean she's a beautiful girl but she didn't use that really to get there she could have used her looks way more she's like six foot blonde gorgeous she could have been like more like Britney Spears or something but she's like always had a wholesome image I don't know I just like I like that about her and I feel like she has a really good heart and I think that with her alive she helps the music world okay like how she wrote that letter to Apple she said that she wouldn't sign with them unless there's a non-negotiable contract that every other artist on the label had to get paid more from Spotify. Me and her are the same age. I think that's why I relate to her too. She was in the 90s. So she probably saw the last glance of like CDs and physical sales. It's like having a physical album. Like she likes to have it have the artwork, the meaning, the way it used to be when you got an album, you know, you'd open it up, you'd look at the insert, you'd read the lyrics. It would be a whole experience. That's what I like an album to be like, you know, it's like, I guess, old fashioned. At a certain point, if we don't have anyone in the mainstream that's popular that is pushing that, we're not going to have albums anymore. They'll become obsolete. When somebody who's not as powerful as Taylor Swift doesn't think albums, like she's so big that if she thinks they're powerful, then they'll keep making them. Like they're like, okay, we'll keep putting out CDs. If there were more people at the top that were like that, that were musicians, like a lot less musicians would be getting left over. You know, it's a very competitive industry and a lot of women always want to compete. So so many people have given me so much crap about it. It's like insane. It just made me become a bigger fan, to be honest. I don't like getting told what to do or like, I don't like being told what I can't like. 
Well, you're exhibiting a warrior spirit. Let's transition to the third song here. If somebody tells me I can't like something, I'll probably end up liking it more. Especially over and over again. They just kept telling me like that she supported Trump and all this stuff. And it's like, I know she didn't. And then she came out and said she didn't. I already knew all this. I didn't need her to do that. You know what I mean? It sounds dumb, but when you like an artist, you know what they're like, kind of. When you're a new musician, you research them. You read their interviews. I didn't need her to come out and tell me point blank. You know what I mean? Like, I believed in her from the beginning. The media never did, and they always wanted to destroy her. If I believe in artists and read their own words, like, I don't need the media's interpretation of it. It's rare for folks to listen to even more than one song in a row by an artist. So whole albums or actually researching, like, no, it's the one single that kind of gets you going. Like, I think that's just gotten worse in the, that's always been a radio thing, but yeah. And that's why the Reputation tour was so crazy because it's like, she didn't release any, a lot of the songs from Reputation were not on the radio and everybody at the concert, like 30,000 people all knew the words, you know, none of those songs were on the radio. That's her fan base. Like, they listen to the whole album, you know? And her fan base is cool, too. I feel like her fan base is me. A lot of them are really, they've listened to my music. They're just, like, cool people, too. Like, they actually respect songwriting. I feel like, you know, there's trends in music. And she's been around for, like, 10 years now. So it's like she's gone through different trends, but different things come and go. Like, right now, mumble rap is popular or something, you know? These things, that they're not going to test the time. Is It's like there's always flash in the pan popular stuff. Can we transition into, I know you've already said a bunch of things about Warrior and even sang part of it earlier in this interview. We're finally going to hear it in full. You guys got a glimpse of my Warrior spirit right now. thing I care about. And that song was, that's the earlier song I I wrote too and I re-recorded it. That used to be on the EP. And then I re-recorded it for Stardust. But that song's just special to me. But it also bites me in the ass sometimes too. Like when I'm not feeling very strong in the back of my head, I'll be like, are you a warrior? And I'm like, shut up.
A lot of this album, Stardust, is drenched with tape hiss, which you could just apply a filter. What? But do you like the tape hiss, or is this just a kind of, I just want it out there? I was recording it with somebody who now has a restraining order on me. So that album I recorded with the lead singer of Oxygen when I used to be in the band. And he's like all over the place and kind of crazy. And he wanted like complete control over mixing it. So that's why it sounds like that, okay? Is a very distinct sound difference in the three albums, and you can tell because of who produced them all. That sound is Sam France. Like, sure, I like some of the textures, but it was also hard to fix. We recorded on an eight track tape machine. So it literally was on the tape machine. We traveled across the country with the tape machine. I think the tape machine got messed up. It had been in the airport. That was a whole mess. I'm surprised the album even came out. It was like this guy, he like took me to court for a me, got a restraining order on me. I haven't seen him in five years. But he withheld my album from me for, and wouldn't give it to me. He had all the tapes, okay? And then I wanted it back. I'm like, this is my album. And he's like, I'm producing it. I'm like, I don't care. I wrote the song. So I had to like get it back from him. And so I was surprised it even came out, Stardust, okay? And I was so upset because of all the drama. I didn't know what to call it or even. And that's why I put my friend on the cover. Because she was like the person who believed in me the most. And she died during the making of the album. And she like knew all the songs and she really wanted to hear the album. And I was so bummed about it. And so I just like put her on the cover because I felt like it was a way of eclipsing all the drama that went along with the album. Because it's like I wanted it to be so that one day if Sam ever looks at that album that he recorded with me, he sees my friend that he met her too. She let us stay with her. So it's like I kind of did that. Like it was like my way of being like it was a really bad scenario. But then I just tried to finish it for her. It was like, wasn't perfect. And it was like, I didn't really know what I was doing. I was younger then. So the tape his stuff. Yeah, I probably just wanted it out and wanted it done with, you know, and it was just a very like intense time period. But I definitely didn't want the second album to sound like that. I didn't like how you can't hear my vocals on certain songs. I mean, some songs on there get no justice compared to how I think some songs on there are like really good that actually are not that well recorded on there. Like, I like that song recorded kind of, but you can't really hear what I'm saying. It's like, I like the way the drums sound and stuff, but it's like, can't hear anything I'm saying and the lyrics in that song are important to me that's why on the next albums I made it so my lyrics are really up in the front right I had thought about in trying to cover a variety of your work of having something like daddy's gone that's much more grungy but that it's not an accident that you never did that again not an accident daddy's gone's like one of the only examples of the set of, I, of me liking that sound because it fits that song in a way like for some reason it sounds good on daddy's gone but like on some of the other songs I don't like it at all on that song, it sounds like gritty and it kind of matches it like in a way. But the rest of the album, I wasn't really want to get on it so much. It's just that I didn't really know what I was doing. And I got effed over in the middle of recording and the tape machine got taken from me. It was like just drama. So with Warrior, it is still mixed. I mean, yes, there's drums in it, but the drums are way in the background such that you can't even really tell when it's not quite in <laughs> It's you on your guitar setting what the pace is. I assume the, the drums were overdubbed later, all this Tom stuff, or was that while you were singing it? I don't even remember. And it has a lot of these places where there's these big Tom parts that are answering you. So there's not like a lot of drums through the whole thing. It's more just refuse to let my arrows go, do, 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 you know, a little fill put in there. Yeah, that was Sam. We were trying to make it sound like 60s or something. like. I mean, they would use timpani if you can get them. <laughs> Just be yeah, he's a big tom is, is usually the only thing that's on hand. I've tried to do that sound a lot. That song, it's like I'm trying to think, because that's the only song I think that got mixed by somebody else. So it sounds like a little bit, a little bit cleaner. 
I'm sure that was one of the reasons why it jumped out at me. It's also interesting. So it's a five and a half minute song. Because this is very similar in some ways to the Everything's a Spiral. Obviously, you said that they were written at a similar time quite a while ago. But in this one, you felt like, yeah, the energy is worth, we can take it a full five minutes. It's crazy because on Romantic Cancer, it has the most amount of songs and the shortest songs of all my albums. The longest song on there is like three minutes and something, I think. So I definitely like made a change with the songwriting structures of it just kept going on and it's like I didn't know how to end it because I needed to put the verse at the end and it used to have the trumpet in there so it used to be a longer song live because it would be more dramatic it'd be like are you a warrior it was like more of a like do you get the audience to sing with you on this when you try to do live I should, I should. okay you guys when I play this you're all gonna go Boo. have the breakout acapella chorus at the end exactly well I got paranoid because somebody told me before too that People like short songs. So then I was like, fine. And so it's funny because, uh, yeah, like Romantic Cancer is 13 songs, but like the longest one is Everything's a Spiral. And I wrote it a long time ago. The end of the song, the massive delay on the end of Warrior, was that a decision in post? You just said, I don't know how to a- end the song. Well, you end it with an effect. It's like something you couldn't even do live here. Yeah, I just wanted to sound like dreamy at the end. And I guess the song, too, is about like people being afraid of aging. If I want to talk about the meaning of it, I guess I wrote about it a little bit. The years are changing our faces, like we're someone different than before. The years are changing our faces. Our youth may now be worn. Okay, like everyone's afraid of growing old. Our faces are slates or stories should be told. Like everyone's afraid of getting wrinkles. Okay, so uh, to me, it's like a psychic war of feeling okay about yourself. That's what the song is about. Like it's like about like society making you feel like you need to like. Yeah, so it's actually I wrote that when I was younger because my aunt. Not that I care if anyone gets plastic surgery, but my aunt got a bunch of it at one point, and I thought that she already looked really pretty. Someone told me this line that laugh, uh, wrinkles are like time every time you ever laughed. So you're racing every time you ever laughed. So that line I would like, it was like our faces are slates where stories should be told. I was wondering why that theme connected to a warrior, but your explanation works there. But then the final image of that is don't let your arrows go. Like, isn't that what you have to do if you're fighting with an arrow? You have to let it go. Like, well, that's kind of the whole point. Yeah, but also, like, maybe you just think you do because you think you need to, like, defend yourself or prove something, but you don't. Like, really, you just need them for yourself. Like, kind of like you don't need to give anything to anybody. Sure. Or explain anything to anybody. Like, it could be taken either way, for sure. That part could be taken either way. You do need your arrows to, like, protect yourself. But also it's like maybe your arrows are like something special to you. And why just give them away? I refuse to give them away and change. Sure, sure. With a leg of a bow and a foot of an arrow. Like I've just never even heard those words next to each other. I don't know (laughs) know exactly what it means. Leg of a bow, I know. I don't even know. I just like wordplay and sometimes stuff like that will come out. But I still build a bit the theme, you know? All right. Well, we're nearing toward the end of here. Well, let's introduce the last thing. So... Off a of Romantic Cancer at Black Tar. I assume this is an actual new song we'll hear written recently here. This is a new song. And it has James Felice on it from the Felice Brothers, who I always really liked. And they play with Connor Oberst, or he does. He's his, like, accordion player. You want to give folks a hint of what this is about, or just leave them with it? Well, it's open to... It's kind of weird, because I wrote it on, like, a progression of, like, there's this movie, Gilda with Rita Hayworth in it. And in it, there's a song, Put the Blame on Mame. And it has like really weird chord progressions and I just wanted to cover it. But then instead, I just wrote my own song with the chord progressions. It's like a 30 song. Like it's called Put the Blame on Mame. I mean, my song is different. I didn't copy it. It's just that the chord structure is similar. It's a really good song. It's an old black and white film. So the song, it kind of like, people are like, I know it kind of has a dark, name like it i know it sounds like what the hell like black tar like a real like, is this song about heroin you know it's like that's not what it's about i know it's called black tar but like also black tar isn't only just heroin you know i had it more in mind that like old british folk music like the fairport convention and steel eye span and that kind of stuff oh you did yeah <laughs> thank you yeah because somebody i didn't like that people were thinking i was talking about like someone told me to hug my heroin that's not what i'm talking about <laughs> sure i mean but like i said everything can be open to interpretation but it's also like the analogy, it's like black tar open the scar, you know, like people associate black tar with like dark things. So an open the scar, I gave it everything. I mean, it could be in a reference to people using or something, but it's definitely not. I don't know. The song is very weird to me. It's like this jazzy little like waltzy song that's really short. 
James actually helped me a lot, the accordion player, because I just had it basically written out. As a, I gave him like complete control. Like I had it written out and I trust him a lot with music. So I just like all the accordion parts he made up on the spot. And it like made the song for me. Like he like transformed the song in a way. I can't hear it now a little bit without hearing the like the accordion. So before I let you go, have you written half the material for the next album already or what's the status? Definitely. Yeah, I have written. Any characterization of how the new stuff is going differently than what's on Romantic Cancer? Or is it too soon to tell? (laughs) Too soon to tell, but it probably will be a little different. Uh, It probably will be like more dreamy or like it probably won't be as downery, I guess. This album's about like someone afraid to be in love and viewing love as a cancer. So the next album, I think, will be more magical or fantastical or something more political too i don't know i just got this thing with spotify where i can upload my own music directly to the website like i got chosen as one of the independent artists that so now i can get paid directly from spotify so it's like i had some songs i was gonna put on the next album but now i'm like thinking i should just put it as a single on spotify because then i will get all the royalties like i've never had that power on there to do that everything i've had to upload through my label and then they get a cut so it's kind of awesome that now Spotify like is doing that. It's like finally they're like getting on the ball to pay people more. So I think that will actually help people like me who are smaller artists too, because not everybody has a lot of money or like a bunch of people to help you. So, but if you have a fan base, that's all they'll listen to your music. And me, it's like, I might not have a lot of money and stuff, but I have like people who will stream my music. So it's nice now that I've gotten to this momentum where I feel like I can upload it to Spotify and like, you know, my fans will listen to it. I mean, it would be nice to have PR and stuff, but it's nice knowing that my fans will just listen to it, like in that it could start streaming and I could make the money off it. Because now I'm like monetized on YouTube, too. I've like utilized the Internet a lot for stuff like this. So I like to use the platforms that pay artists the most. Yeah, I saw you've uploaded a, a, quite a few covers. Have have those gotten? Oh my god, I have so many covers. You a lot of extra attention the the you know that you're doing Taylor Swift covers and things like that to. They're fans. I mean, I'm like the Swifties. That's what I call them. They follow me. Nice. They're like, they, and I, well, I'm going to put one of the covers album on Spotify. I already uploaded it because they like make it for you legal. So I'm excited because that's going to come out like October. It's coming out like in a week. Well, very cool. Thanks for doing this. Good luck with the next project here. Thank you so much, Mark. Thanks so much to Elizabeth. As much as I like having artists like Phil Judd, who I've been listening to since my youth, I'm extremely happy to have young, fresh talent on display here as well. Again, to find more about her, check her on facebook.com slash globelamp, or just look her up on YouTube, Spotify, Bandcamp, etc. We here at Nakedly Examined Music are on the cusp of 100 episodes, and my guest next time will be another veteran artist, Dan Stewart, from the legendary sort of cowpunk band Green on Red who's released several solo albums, moved to Mexico, and become really more of an author at this point. So come on back and check that out and many other episodes at nakedlyexaminedmusic.com. Now, I have been threatening for a while to stop doing this unless I got more supporters. And I want to thank especially Josh Stone, who contributed a great deal to this. Also, Lincoln Barr, one of my past guests here. Alistair Young, David Hurst, 
Ismael C., Paul Jennings, Robin Coleman, and new guy Mark Bauer for supporting the podcast on Patreon. And yes, if you have listened to more than five episodes of this podcast, I would very much like to plead with you to appeal to your sense of responsibility and fairness and mostly to your self-interest because more support there means I'm more likely to do more of these. The other factor, as you may have noticed from the past few episodes, is commercials. If I can get commercials, will those pay for all the expenses involved? And if I can't, well, then after episode 100, you may be waiting longer between episodes. I've already slowed down a great deal in my rate of recording, and I may slow down even further or even stop if I cannot actually support this thing financially. So that's patreon.com slash music. If you use the Patreon feed instead of the public feed, you will never have to hear any of those commercials. If you sign up for a pledge there, you'll only be charged per episode. So if I stop making them, it doesn't cost you anything. Just get on there, pledge even a dollar. You can message me through there, tell me what you like, don't like about the show. Start a conversation. Everyone can follow the podcast on Facebook, look me up on Twitter, or perhaps follow the Nakedly Examined Music playlist on Spotify. Most importantly, keep on musicin'. This is Mark Lintz-Meyer signing off. Thank you.